Well, thank you very much, Guggen. I'm Don Wallace. I'm the chairman of the International Law Institute, and I want to welcome you all to this latest in the series that Guggen mentioned. Our topic is global COVID-19 and sports, threats and responses. Uh, sports have been very much in the news, so this is extremely timely. At this point, I will, as I always do, uh, turn the program over to Yona. So, Yona. Thank you very much, uh, Don. Uh, again, thank you uh, for your uh, decades-long uh, uh, leadership in this uh, area and cooperation. Uh, we had, of course, uh, other institutions uh, who supported uh, our modest academic uh, effort. Uh, over the years, uh, the um, International uh, Center for uh, Terrorism Studies and um, our colleagues uh, at the Potomac Institute, particularly General Al Bray, the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, and uh, the Chairman of the Board of Regents, uh, he participated in many of our events. And uh, of course, our colleagues of the National Security Law of the University of Virginia Law Schools and many other institutions uh, in this country and around the world. Um, I, I would like to, to just um, make one little footnote before we move uh, into introducing uh, our distinguished uh, panel. Again, uh, for, for many, many years, actually, decades uh, since the 1972 uh, Munich Olympics uh, and through the Atlanta Games, and then uh, more recently the Rio Olympics and all that, uh, we, we try to focus on the security, health, and business uh, concerns as key um, items uh, related to, to planning what uh, can be done to somehow reduce the risks. Um, as uh, Don mentioned, uh, this year alone we had, uh, I think, four ambassador forms related to interdisciplinary uh, issues, um, the uh, business uh, issues, the international uh, aspects, um, energy, and so on. And uh, today, uh, event, obviously, I uh, will uh, deal, uh, in my judgment, I think, uh, with the hope that uh, we can uh, cover some of these uh, issues, is uh, basically uh, what is uh, the current uh, challenge, uh, two, uh, what is next, and three, who is in charge uh, in coordinating the response efforts that are in the broad and of course, uh, the fourth uh, issue relates to the sports section, particularly uh, the role of the sports uh, section, if you will, in combating the COVID-19, as uh, Don mentioned. Um, in other words, uh, we, we have to look, I think, at the past uh, lessons, the current and future uh, outlook, and then perhaps to suggest some best uh, practices, uh, responses to deal with the issue. Uh, finally, as uh, always, I, I think that uh, it's important for clarity and transparency that in addition to uh, this uh, Zoom conferencing uh, today, the video of the event will be available, as you know, uh, for viewing at the ILI website and elsewhere and the uh, publication of the proceedings of the published uh, report, both electronically or uh, copy, will be uh, available for a uh, wider uh, audience. Now, uh, very, uh, very quickly, uh, I, I would like to introduce the uh, panel, but in, in light of the uh, significance of the topic and and the very distinguished uh, speakers, I, I would like to uh, introduce them uh, briefly according to the program order, which uh, you do have. Uh, in, in other words, the uh, uh, introduction uh, can be very long, but we will uh, obviously publish 
the very uh, distinguished, I think, background of the speakers and the publication, uh, some of the highlights, at least, and I, I would like to develop this according to uh, three parts, uh, part one, to introduce the first uh, three uh, speakers who are going to provide some uh, overview, I think, related to the health and uh, science and sports uh, issues. And then the second uh, group, three speakers, again, uh, will uh, focus on uh, their concerns from the legal and other uh, aspects. And finally, to have uh, the two commentators, the two ambassadors, who are going to um, contribute to our discussion. They participated in the past and so on and so forth. So what I, I would like to do uh, immediately now is to introduce uh, the distinguished uh, university professor Rita Caldwell. Um, and um, she contributed immensely to our work uh, over many, many years. Um, I, I would uh, prefer that uh, she uh, would use the time to discuss what uh, she's working on at this time and um, what updates can she uh, offer uh, briefly and then we'll come back to her later on. Uh, the next uh, speaker following um, Professor Caldwell is Dr. Richard Reff, who is an orthopedic uh, surgeon and sports uh, medicine uh, specialist, as many of you know. He also participated in our events before. Uh, he was an advisor to the US Olympic Committee and past international chairman of safety, security, and uh, medical issues at the Maccabee Games uh, in Israel and so forth. So uh, the uh, three of them, uh, actually, uh, in addition to that, we have uh, Carl Francis, who is Director of Communications at the National Football League Players Association. So uh, he, he will uh, jump into um, that group. And then I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the, the other panelists uh, later on and with more information about their background. So, uh, Rita? Yes. Um, I think uh, you were going to show some slides for me or shall I uh, show them here? Very good. What I'm going to do is uh, very briefly, um, could you make that share screen so that, uh, yeah, very good. I'm, I'm very briefly go through some of the, the work that uh, we've done and uh, some of the interesting information background on coronavirus and COVID-19. The next slide, please. Uh, we have learned so much um, in a very, very short time. Initially, we felt that um, um, in December, it was a strange respiratory illness, very similar to SARS and MERS, which had occurred of a decade or so earlier. But uh, in January, we were able to sequence the organism its DNA. We at first thought it was simply a respiratory infection. Now we know it affects all of the organs and can cause serious damage. Uh, it even can affect the brain. Uh, and it has persistent uh, effects, which we are now just beginning to discover, and the potential as well for individuals who recover to be reinfected. So this has turned out to be a very um, how shall I say, malicious disease. Um, and it's one of a family of viruses called the coronaviridae, which does include influenza, the common influenza virus, as well as SARS and MERS. And so very likely we're going to have outbreaks in the future of perhaps additional related viruses um, and perhaps with uh, e equal or even more serious uh, potential damage. Go to the next slide. Um, so I want to uh, point out that we've been able in a very short time by uh, January, late January, early February, to identify the organism, to detect it 
in uh, saliva, in throat swab, and uh, some work that my own team has been doing. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate uh, not only identifying the strain of the original infection, but also some of the various mutant strains that have been arising over the last several months. We have the next slide, please. And so one of the findings that I think is really important, I showed this slide before, and it's proving to be extremely valuable information, is that we can detect it in about 50% of individuals with symptoms in the stool. And the next slide shows, um, it's a fairly complicated slide. Uh, the red shows that um, the individual throat swab was positive. The yellow is the continuing shedding of the virus into the stool um, up to a week or two post uh, infection where the symptoms have either abated or have disappeared. Uh, next slide. So this means that what we can do, and since I last spoke with you, uh, or spoke on the subject with you, um, we had at that time learned from work done in the Netherlands, uh, in Australia, in Sweden, that uh, sewage samples were a pretty good uh, early warning system. Well, since then, uh, this has been taken up by um, uh, several states in the United States where there is now a concerted effort underway to monitor sewage as a much better detector of community infections. May I have the next slide, please. And so what this allows us to do here in Maryland, we have launched the team that I uh, lead and the company that I formed some 15 years ago. We have launched a uh, contractual study with the Maryland Department of Environment, Maryland Department of Health, and these are the locations, the treatment plants, um, in various parts of um, the state and neighboring state, Virginia, where we've been doing analyses on a regular basis, and we're beginning to be able to determine as an early warning system, because the virus can be detected about a week or 10 days before it actually manifests as a case, and it can be maybe 14 days uh, or longer before deaths will occur. So this gives us an opportunity to be prepared and to also understand when, as the governor of Maryland has just decided not to go into stage three, because there's an uptick occurring in uh, the numbers of cases in the District of Columbia and in Maryland. You have the next slide, please. So this is a, another aspect that we're working on is that we had developed some 15 or 20 years ago a technique using satellite imagery to measure environmental parameters. And it has been observed by others as well as our team that humidity plays a significant role uh, in SARS and it turns out in COVID-19 as well. Now the next slide. So we have done studies uh, using Michigan, where we did our calculation of our model using satellite-sensed data and the predictive model that we are now using to predict cholera, working with UNICEF and the British Aid Agency to provide supplies, physicians, and so forth in the places in Yemen with the highest risk of cholera. So we've taken that model, we've modified it, Corona-19, COVID-19, and shown on the, um, the uh, uh, right-hand side um, is the uh, actual cases, hum uh, are the actual cases, and the predictive model matched up extremely well. May I have the next slide, please? So this is a very, very brief overview to simply say that in a short time, we've been able to isolate the virus, sequence its uh, genome, the nucleic acid of its genome, learn about the various symptomatologies of it. We now know that it 
is airborne transmis transmitted, but at first we thought by larger droplets, and now we know by micro droplets, and we're now looking at the potential for long distance transmission of a virus in air streams. We are able to combine the clinical tests, the throat swabs and the uh, antibody tests with the detection of the actual virus discharged into sewage so that we are beginning to be able to close in on the distribution and the means to determine where to institute severe measures to protect against it. The vaccine is moving along, but uh, I won't go into the details of it. Let me just say the likelihood of a massive immunization is probably not uh, going to occur before perhaps spring of 2021. But earlier for the uh, first responders, for police, fire, firemen, and uh, individuals who are delivering food and uh, carrying out transportation, but the general public later in the spring. So this is a very general kind of a summation of the amazing amount of information we've gained in the last six months. And this last slide is to emphasize that we have suffered pandemics um, pre uh, Christian era all the way to the present, mainly pandemics of cholera, plague, and now the coronavirus family. So I'll then stop here and uh, turn it over to my colleague to follow me. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Greta, uh, for your uh, overview and uh, bringing us uh, up, up to date of what's happening and in fact your last uh, comment uh, uh, triggered a question but maybe we can discuss it later on with uh, the, the knowledge, the historical record that we uh, have. Um, the question arises whether society is uh, somehow missed uh, one of its years or hundreds of years of uh, lessons, but we can uh, discuss it uh, later, later on uh, with you and our colleagues. I would like to, again, in the interest of time, to ask our colleague, uh, Dr. Richard Reff, uh, to uh, provide also um, some assessment of the situation related to the sports issue. Okay. Uh, first slide. Um, first of all, I would like to say that um, the information that's coming almost hourly has really started to become overwhelming with regard to the, in the world of sports. And I'm actually coming to you as not only a sports doctor, but also as a sports fan. And I think we all have a little bit of that um, within us. Next slide. Um, we're, we're now facing um, new vocabulary in our uh, general speech um, that has to do with the world of sports, such as weird, crazy, unpredictable, strange, different. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? And words of optics versus ethics. Next slide. We see headlines that are changing uh, almost on an hourly and basis, not on a weekly or monthly basis. It's happening very, very quickly. Um, and I'd like to make a comment about this later, about perhaps why um, we're having so much information that's being thrown at us with a, an absence of, of sort of consistency. Next slide. So to, this week is a, a monumental week, I think, in the world of sports, because in the United States, um, sports officially has now reopened. Um, it's significant, I think, that uh, the first 
ball was thrown out by Dr. Anthony Fauci, who we certainly uh, know very well at this point, even though we many of us have never met him in person, but we feel like we all know him. This week, the Major League Baseball season has begun. Um, the National Basketball Association has reopened today. The National Hockey League, I think, begins tomorrow. And the National Football League um, training camps uh, are beginning again. Now we have to ask ourselves, is this a good thing? Is this dangerous? Now we need to kind of explore these, these questions. Next slide. But before we, um, we, we need to also then consider, you know, a lot of different factors in relation to the pandemic. Um, the risk benefit ratio that we would consider with sports, the safety factors for participants, which would include players, coaches, and staff, the safety of spectators, fans and parents, because we're looking at a broad age group. And then we have to also think about the ethics of participation. Are, are, is the participation being driven by um, the financial gain of the organizers and owners? Is it driven by politics? Is it driven at the risk of the health of the participants? We know that in sports, there are necessary and unnecessary risks. The necessary risks, of course, are if you're playing a sport, you could get injured. But the unnecessary risks are somewhat of the unknown part of this whole pandemic, which we're clearly not, we don't have a, a good handle on. Next slide. So what are the, we know, just to reiterate, the value of sports in our society, it's, our culture is very strongly associated with sports. It provides a diversion of daily life's pressures. It clearly is uh, an industry of entertainment, and it does provide an economic um, stimulus in the economy. There are jobs, not just the highly compensated individuals who are very small in number in relationship to the entire picture, but also the jobs of those individuals who are the, the vendors, the ticket salespeople, the parking lot attendants, the hotel employees, etc. They all are part of this entire picture. Next slide. The Aspen Institute's pro uh, project play has produced some very good information as it relates to children and kids in sports and the value of sports in the active life of a child that goes beyond just their uh, tender ages. It goes right up into adulthood. So we know that there is, there's a very important component in a child's life and in the life of, the, of, of our uh, community, as you'll see in the next slide, please, that sports participation does help the health and welfare of the society that we live in. Next slide. But we have to take a, a step backwards for a second, and that is that Sports are games, and, and life and death is reality, and we're giving a lot of attention to restarting games, and I emphasize the word games, lest we forget that people are becoming sick and are dying, and this was a physician in Baltimore who just recently passed away, and he was the, he was the director of an intensive care unit that was dealing with the COVID-19 patients. Next slide. So from the overview of sports in general, I tried to break it down into different categories. We have the international sporting events. We have the professional sports, college sports, high school sports, and youth sports. Next, next slide. So the Olympic Games. Well, no other sports event embodies the global perspective of COVID-19. Virtually every country in the world participates in the event and therefore is affected by the pandemic. Every four years, we look forward to the world's youth coming together in a, and I'll emphasize the word, peaceful gathering. It's not to be taken lightly. Next slide. You know, we look forward to the inspiration we derive from those athletes who have, in many cases, sacrificed and prepared for many years to achieve their Olympic dream. Next slide. The Olympic Games have only been canceled in our modern history since 1896, three times. And all three occasions, it was related to a world war, World War I and World War II in particular. So we can look at this next slide as really that we're in the midst of a war. We're in the midst of a war with, with a, an enemy that 
it's we, we're trying to describe, we're trying to understand, but we don't really see them coming behind us. There's um, challenges that the attempting to, you know, the, right now the Olympic Games have not been canceled, they've been postponed, but the challenges and logistics to have a normal Olympic Games in the presence of COVID-19 are monumental and are, instrum and are insurmountable per potentially. I uh, created this acronym called FAT a number of years ago with, when I was helping to plan uh, the Maccabea Games. And I found that, you know, if you break down things into common denominators, sometimes it's easier for people to understand them. So in, in most events, if you can provide food, accommodation, and transportation in a safe, healthy, and, and efficient way, you're pretty much guaranteed of having a very successful event. Well, these three areas, food, accommodation, and transportation, are extremely affected by the ability of organizers with the pandemic to be able to move forward. Next slide. So now we moved into professional sports. So we're, we're witnessing the chaotic return of play of some, such as Major League Baseball. We're witnessing the well thought out plans of others, such as the National Basketball Association and the National Hockey League. And we will witness the return of the big brother of American sports, and that is the National Football League. But let's not pretend that there are not controversial ethical and health concerns for resumption of play by these entities. Players are opting out because of lack of confidence in health and safety protocols, which include testing, rules, environment. Are resources, in the, from a controversial perspective, are resources needed by the general population being diverted to allow high priced sports to occur? How do sports franchises have better access to testing and speed of testing results that across the board are not available to the rest of us, including, and I'm saying the rest of us, including myself, because I'm a medical professional and this is not easy to get. Next slide. So we need to also, you know, it's not gloom and doom for everything, but we do need to remember, you know, the, the, the thrill of victory and what sports has meant for our society. Next slide. But this is contrasted with what might be considered what we call, you know, the, 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 new, the new terminology of the new normal, whatever that really is. But the new normal in baseball, in Major League Baseball. Look on the left. We have cardboard fans. We have an enormous stadium. To the right, we now see people, managers wearing masks. Next slide. We have empty seats. We have minimal physical contact. The chaos, in my opinion, next slide. The chaos that we're seeing currently in Major League Baseball, um, we glibly talked about the Marlins a bit before the, the session began, but games have been canceled. There's an extraordinarily high number of, of positive tests coming out of a single team. Testing is not done daily within this system. Um, there is a home and home schedule where there's travel concerns. There's the whole issues of fat, as I indicated before. So we may actually look back at the Major League Baseball experience in some time in the near future and, and look at this as an example of what not to do instead of how they managed it nicely. Next slide. In contrast, the NBA at the moment has created a bubble environment. What is a bubble environment? Well, it's effectively creating a quarantine with strict rules. You can't leave the bubble. If you do, then there are consequences. There are daily tests of COVID-19. Next slide. The National Hockey League has similarly had a very similar um, approach to this problem by creating not one bubble, but two bubbles because of the uh, geography. There's one, there's a, a bubble in Edmonton and there's also a bubble in Toronto, which again, similar 
situations, and again, across a geographical border. So it can be done. Next slide. And then we have the National Football League. Will the Major League Baseball experience be the window to what will happen to the National Football League? Well, if we look at it, fans will be permitted in the stadiums, albeit smaller capacity. Is that really necessary? Now, if you look at the financials from what has been reported by the Green Bay Packers, which are the only um, team in the National Football League that is publicly owned, so they're required to file with the SEC papers so that it becomes a window to the rest of the league in terms of what the financial situations are. The Packers president, Mark Murphy, said that we're good. We're in good shape. We can pay the, the entire uh, payroll essentially is covered by the media money. And if we, if we do have fans in the stands, we're only, it only is re, we, we've calculated that it only will take 12,000 people so that we can break even. Now that may be, I don't know how accurate that is or isn't, but that also um, takes into account that if you're open, you also are having individuals working there and you have to pay their salaries. Next slide. So players, however, are opting out. They're uncertain as to their personal safety. Next slide. Then we move to college sports. Well, most universities and colleges are going to virtual education in the fall to keep students apart, minimize social gathering and contact. Live classroom experiences will be minimal. I have a son who will be a sophomore and then a major university. So 100% of his classes will be online. School administrations are making drastic changes for the health and welfare of the students and the faculty. How do collegiate sports fit into that model? Next slide. Well, colleges, as I said, are bracing for huge losses also from declining enrollment due to the pandemic. And at the same time, athletic departments are facing dramatic losses, their, their own starting with the cancellation back in March of the NCAA basketball tournament. So there, there are a lot of financial pressures here. Salaries within the athletic departments in relation to the rest of the departments and universities are extremely high. I mean, ridiculously high in comparison. I won't say ridiculous, that's, the, that's, in, that's unfair, but they're extremely high in relationship to the average professor who's teaching the kids. So the health and welfare of the student athletes, um, are they, is that being taken into consideration or are they being sacrificed to pay the salaries of the high priced salaries? You know, what is the justification for holding sports but not holding classes? It's a reasonable question to ask. Next slide. So will college football happen in 2020? Next slide. What are some of the colleges doing in order to, to try to um, minimize risks? Well, on the left is, a, is the coach at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's actually got a six foot long pole, and he's demonstrating to his players what six feet apart really means. Um, on the right, um, you can, it's hard to see it, but the, the player number 12 has a newly constructed face shield inside of his helmet to try to prevent um, further uh, exposure uh, of breathing from one player to another. Next slide. So the updates are happening more than daily, just to give you an idea of sort of the constant changing of the landscape. And this is all over the place. It's not just in the East, it's in the Midwest and it's in the West, et cetera. And Governor Cuomo has just come out with, a, uh, with an edict of saying no fans of college sports in the state of New York. Next, next slide. So what are the current responses by uh, what we see in the, in the collegiate ranks? Well, the Ivy League was the first uh, conference to, uh, to come out with a definitive strategy and plan. They said all, all sports in the fall will be canceled. No questions. The Big Ten canceled all conference games. You can see uh, going down the line, the, the two of the big ones, the, the SEC in the South and the Big 12 in the South, um, are being really somewhat ridiculed in the media because of their failure to come up with any definitive plan. 
They keep saying that they are going to, uh, they were going to have a decision by the end of July. Well, we only have one more day in July, and they've said now we're pushing it off till August. Next slide. The NCAA also had canceled, has, has canceled all 22 of its fall championship sports. So what about now we're going down the next, the next category into the high school sports. Well, the absence of sports in high school truly is, is tragic, it's sad, but in reality, it's no less strange than the forced virtual schooling that these kids are having to go through. Decisions that are being made at the high school level are based upon local regulations, and it's all over the board, all over the place in pretty much every jurisdiction around the United States. And what we really see is there's a lack of strong oversight for the health and safety of these kids. Next slide. So just as an example of, of the difficulty or the challenge of social distancing, on the left you see, okay, um, a batter, a catcher, and an umpire. Um, they're all within six feet. When the player is on first base, the first baseman doesn't say to the player, the runner on first base, excuse me, you have to get six feet away from me. No, the game has to proceed. Next slide. So the left is, is a little bit of a, of a commentary of, of what was. And today, this is a uh, uh, view of, from, from a helicopter of a little league field with empty stands. That's kind of what is right now. Next slide. So I do have some you know, personal opinions, you know, in regard to youth sports, because this is what I do a lot with um, as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I have seen in the last six weeks, kids who were playing in soccer clubs, lacrosse clubs, travel baseball, gymnastics clubs, and even tackle football. Um, and the, it, it's really bizarre and irrational when you're sitting and listening to the stories of the kids who are injured and how this whole thing is manifested. Um, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. Montgomery County is one of the more uh, controlled counties in the, in the United States in terms of uh, regulations. So most of the uh, patients and the kids that I've taken care of live in Montgomery County, but none of them are playing in Montgomery County. All these organizers are taking these kids out of Montgomery County into Delaware, into other counties in the state of Maryland and other places just to play. And uh, uh, I, I've had the opportunity to ask a lot of the parents, you know, what, what their thinking is, and uh, it's not very rational. So I, I really see that the health and safety risks of the youth seem to be secondary to some of the financially based uh, motivation of the organizers, and perhaps the way that the organizers are trying to delude the parents as to the capability uh, of, the, of their children. Um, and as I said, holding these events outside of restricted zones is, is really, I don't think is the right thing to do. Next, next slide. So in conclusion, the landscape of sports is changing almost hourly. Nobody knows what is going to happen. And there, in my opinion, there is really no leadership to give direction. And this is one of the things that I'm feeling that with all this information that's coming at us from, from so many different directions, the one common denominator is there's, there, there's no consistency in, in approach or understanding of the health and safety issues. And it seems like every governmental entity and sports organizations are acting independently and trying to invent their own wheel. There's no clarity of strategy from governing bodies, which is not just uh, government, it's also from those governing bodies that organize the sports. And the decisions that are, that are, that are based on scientific evidence are being greatly ignored, and I think being motivated more by politics than by science. Next slide. So in, in summary, I would say to everybody, wear your mask, limit physical contact, practice social distancing, wash your hands frequently. I've never washed my hands so, many in my, so much in my entire life and frequent in use of hand sanitizers. Next slide. So to end on a light note, I, I saw this, uh, this was uh, the original um, uh, 
uh, music score for Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which is certainly relevant to this time of the year. And I thought I would go through the song. So it's Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but not this year. Take Me Out with the Crowd. Well, there's no crowds this year. Buy Me Some Peanuts and Cracker Jacks, not this year either. I don't care if I never get back, but you're not going anywhere this year. Let me root, root, root for the home team. That's okay, but you have to do it from home. And if they don't win, it's a shame. Well, that's true. For it's one, two, three strikes, you're out. Well, at least some things haven't changed at the old ball game, and we really have to wonder, will it ever be the same? Next slide. Be safe. Thank you. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ricky. I uh, obviously you you covered not only uh, the forests here but uh, many of the trees, and um, I I always look at uh, you know some other options, and it's not the time to to ask you a question, but keep this in mind maybe for later on. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel here, for example? Do the Olympics, uh, with all the challenges and the dangers, can they bring together nations, not only in time of peace, but in time of what we call war? But at any rate, uh, we, we can discuss this and maybe many of the other issues that you mentioned. I want to move on on the program with our colleague, Carl Francis, who is the Director of Communications for the National Football League Players Association. And as I understand it, as Director of Communications, is responsible to, to manage the public uh, image of the NFLPA and the very rich uh, background. And I'm, I'm delighted that he's uh, offering a course at Georgetown uh, related to the sports uh, issue. You are in the right place at the right time. And um, we look forward to your remarks. Carl? Well, thank, thank you so much. You know, I greatly appreciate it. And I'm so honored to be here with such a distinguished guest. Um, uh, one of the things uh, I, I really uh, wanted to share is uh, kind of give a timeline of how we got to where we are today. Uh, I, I wanted to share something on our uh, website that I, I think is important. Uh, for the uh, audience to see, if I can get there. But um, one of the things that I, I think is unique about our sport, uh, particularly as an organization, it is our job uh, to protect the uh, welfare, uh, the wages, and most importantly, the health and safety of our players. Uh, this has been done in, in numerous years uh, as relates to the common just everyday uh, health risk that players face uh, as football players. And we all know uh, that's a pretty tall task when you're talking about a sport uh, that's at a 100% injury uh, rate every year. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when this conversation began to uh, unpack itself as it relates to this, this virus that no one knew but everybody heard a lot about, um, our players began uh, to have the same questions around March at our player rep meeting. And what's, what's interesting is, um, as I talk to several people, they seem to at times separate an NFL player from everyday people. And they're not. They just happen to play a sport. Uh, so when the uh, virus first was introduced uh, to us, uh, we began to, our, our medical advisors, Dr. Tom Mayer and Sean Sansevieri, uh, begin to have conversations with medical experts on what is this virus, what's, what's the content of it. And that was around the March and April period. And to be honest with you, not that we felt we had a little time on our hands, but we knew the NBA was going through their process, okay, and Major League Baseball – uh, was trying to talk and, and so we did take a little step back to take to see the big picture of okay 
how, what was their process of resuming play? Because we were all learning from each other. We were all gathering information from each other from afar, which is important when we're all trying to achieve the same goal in terms of, of um, resuming or, or getting back to play. And so the first thing we did was shut down all of our off-season activities. We just canceled them all. Uh, we told the National Football League that in no way would our players attend off-season training activities, uh, many camps that are usually held around that time, and uh, most important, any um, activities that required a player to report to the training facility. Uh, then around that same time, uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell uh, made the decision that he would move forward with the draft. Um, and we didn't necessarily have a problem with that because um, we knew that it did not in person. I thought it was a little unique, and I believe most of our fans did as well because it gave more of a personal insight into uh, the life of, 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 of the business of football around the draft. Then as we started getting closer in the, in the May period, we started really digging deep on, okay, wh what is this space? What do we look like in this space, right? And so our executive committee uh, was brought together and we started having meetings of all the reports that we were getting from our medical experts along with the National Football League and others who were involved in how do we understand this sport and whether we can get back, whether we can begin play uh, in, in training camp. Uh, and what we started to realize is, is that there's a lot of information that we didn't know. And we weren't surprised because it's new. But what made it a little uh, unnerving was the fact that we didn't understand how it would impact other sports as they were revving up because it was for a while that the NBA was unsure whether they would resume play. And so when we saw Adam uh, Silver and others contemplating whether they should play or not or how they can build this infrastructure in order to provide a safe and healthy uh, environment for their members, we started to take a little notice. But one of the things we did notice is that like anything else, we are a much, much different sport than most because our sport requires physical contact and our sport requires a lot of physical behavior where it allows, it's required of people being close to one another, uh, physically touching each other. And, and so with those elements in place, it became a little, a little more tougher to figure out what's the best way uh, for us to move forward. But not only that bucket, there were many buckets that we had to work within to figure out how do we get back to play. And those buckets are actually still in the process of being reviewed because you and I know uh, that this isn't an overnight process of trying to figure out how to resume and how to get back to a new normal. Uh, a couple of those buckets were, uh, and we mentioned earlier, uh, fans, whether we should have fans in the stadium. Okay, stadium workers, parking attendants, okay, uh, folks that passed out the programs at the games. Uh, we had to deal with the media. Uh, how were we going to manage, uh, excuse me, um, media interviews? How were we going to manage the staff at the facility? Because uh, one of the decisions we made was to have all training camps at their local facilities, right? And then one of the things we wanted to make sure, did it make sense for us to move forward with training activities as we got into the month of June and we still couldn't see where there was any normalcy or even a reduction in, 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 in COVID numbers in different parts of our country? Because we were not just in the NFL environment, but we were in the world environment like everybody, like everyone else. So when we looked at areas such as Arizona with the Arizona Cardinals play, we looked at uh, California, where we have two of our uh, teams, the LA Rams and the LA Chargers. You have uh, Florida, where we have Jacksonville Jaguars. We have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, 
know, our live in environments. They live in communities. And different than basketball, you really can't put football in a bubble because of the number of people who are involved. So how does that look, right? So were we prepared to move forward with even the, 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 the training camp moving uh, at, at, at the pace that it, that it had planned on? So one of the things we talked to the NFL about was, okay, if we can't come to an agreement on when training camp starts, then we have to put in a strong um, acclimation period for our members. And one of those included, we are not playing preseason games. Uh, and there's a lot of football terminology around that that I don't want to bore folks with just in terms of whether they really matter or not. <laughs> uh, they may matter to the common fan, but guess what? We weren't sure where the fans was going to be in the games anyway. So we wanted to make sure that players were in an acclimation period where they can get the, the daily testings that, that, that were negotiated. Uh, the NFL wanted every other day. We wanted every day. We wanted an acclimation periods for players uh, to feel comfortable and get adjusted. So that acclimation period consisted of how many days and how many players could work on strength and conditioning each day. How many players can go out on the field and interact with each other in what we call the off-season uh, training activity, which consists of wearing your shirts and your shorts and just, you know, doing regular training activities. Then this longer acclimation period of the actual physical contact that it takes to get acclimated to actually playing a season. But one thing I want to make sure uh, that we all understand is that these players, and I really get emotional when I talk about it because people don't understand how players feel and how they think. We had at least, I would say, eight all-player calls. And when I tell you there were fathers, there were uncles, there were sons, there were neighbors, there were nephews of people who really were concerned about what this virus meant to the game of football. These conversations at times got very, very intense because the players were, they're part of the communities. They have families, they have fiancés, they have kids, and they have family members who have uh, pre-existing medical conditions that live with them. And when I tell you, after all the meetings that I were a part of, that I was a part of with our doctors and team physicians, I thought I knew a little bit about it and I had all the questions, but I tell you, our players asked numerous questions as it relates to their families. And most of the questions they asked was, how will it impact my family? If I go home, will I, will I risk my, 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 my newborn child? Uh, well, I risk my, my mom who's staying with us. Uh, and if I did, what's the quarantine period? I mean, all these different elements that, that impact everyday humans, everyday people who are part of this process. And so, and I really want to emphasize that because even though they're trying to get back to play a sport to, to do their jobs, but most importantly, they are concerned about their families because we as the NFLPA, we, we love making sure that people understand we don't just represent 2,000 NFL players you should see play on Sundays. We represent 2,000 players and their families because their families are part of one big business. And if we don't protect them, then we can't protect their families. So I want to really uh, show you some information that we uh, put up on our website to really share with our members as they go through the process of kind of staying track of, of COVID and, and how it impacts their life. So I wanna take a look here, if I can get there. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you go to our website, please? I'm sorry. I had it up early, I think. Yes, can you slide it down a little? Right here. Yes. Click on that. Scroll up, please. Yes. So, so these are, this is some of the information that we share with our players and, and the general public as it relates to on uh, some of the new guidelines uh, that 
uh, we've shared with our members. And many of these guidelines are not anything that we've created. Uh, they're not determined by our doctors. They're determined by medical professionals, the CDC, and a number of other medical institutes that, that we work with every day. Uh, now, this number below we wanted to share because it's important. We wanted to be very transparent, and we wanted to ensure that everybody had the information, particularly our members. So the 107 positive tests during the offseason, that doesn't necessarily include players who are reporting to camp yesterday. This includes players that had um, gotten their own tests uh, prior during the offseason uh, that had to go back to the facilities, guys who had uh, players who had uh, offseason surgeries, guys had uh, uh, pre-existing injuries from the previous season, and some of them uh, actually got the test done on their own and reported that to uh, our the, the uh, teams and the NFL. And so that 107 number includes that number as well as the players that exist today. Now, we have had positive tests since players have reported uh, from uh, last Tuesday, I believe, up until yesterday. But one of the things I wanted to make sure that, you know, to me, we want to make sure if, if, if a player tests positive, that's not a bad thing. Because at the end of the day, you have to know where you exist so you want to impact others. Right? You have to understand if you have the process with a lot of mis misinformation about the testing procedures. And there's a lot of uh, misinformation uh, regarding what does a positive test reflect. And our players, they want to know because a lot of them have not been tested. A lot of them are fear for being asymptomatic. And a lot of them don't know people they've been around, uh, family members. So uh, these positive tests are, are good for them because at least they know, okay, I have it now. What can I do to get better? Now I can separate myself from my family. I can separate myself from my teammates. I can quarantine and I can track, trace, and now quarantine and try to get back to my normal life. Now, we did give players options. And I really won't get into the details of that. Most important I am concerned. I have I, I have kids uh, that I'm, and I'm nervous that um, we are not. I'm not safe, and I don't feel as though uh, I'm in the best position to continue to play this year. So, excuse me, one second. They said my my speaker isn't working. I want to make sure that uh, is is that better. We can hear. We can hear. Okay. Now I got a little note. I'm oh, sorry. So I'm sorry about that. So I, I wanted to make sure that um, players understood that. So there were various opt outs, and we have had opt outs. And we, and you know what? We think opting out is okay. That's good because if you're opting out because you fear, as any normal human that is uh, facing this this awful virus, you have the right to say, listen. Uh, we had one young man who opted out, I won't say his name, but he decided to opt out because his, his wife just had uh, a, a child and his, and his wife is type two diabetes. And of course, as it relates to COVID. So he decided to opt out. And we had one young man who's actually a, a doctor, a lineman who was uh, the starting office of line for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he decided to opt out so he can continue to work in the medical uh, facilities in order to save lives and help come up with a cure and help support the folks who are on the front lines um, to help uh, mitigate and get rid of this awful virus. Can you come up a little bit, please, on the screen? Okay. So what we uh, require each team to do is to do a plan. And that plan consists of what actions, what protocols will you take in order for the players to report and put them in a safe environment in a protocol. And they're called the Infectious Disease Emergency Response Plans. So that means that from the first day the player gets to the facility uh, until he goes through his entire process of going into, into the regular season, 
What happens in training camp? If the player is test positive, what's the step? Uh, if he gets hurt, what's the step? If, if, if he gets COVID, does he, is he placed on the football injury list? All these different elements that, that relates. And that took a very long time. And players could not report to the facility unless our either plans were turned in. And to be honest with you, yesterday, I believe, was the last day that everybody turned in their plans because each plan was over 50 pages that each team had to fill out, develop, and send back to us for us and our team to review along with NFL medical officials. officials. So uh, as of today, uh, outer plans, all 32 teams have been approved. All 32 teams are reported to camp, and now players are in the protocol. One of the things that I'll give you the initial uh, acclamation for each player. When a player reports, a player has to test uh, the first day he reports, the second day he reports, he gets a day off on the third day, and then he has to report, he has to test again on the fourth day. But he has to have two double, he has to have two negatives before he's even allowed to enter the building, right? He has to have two negatives because we were afraid of the false negative. So we wanted to make sure that each player uh, felt safe enough to report and allow him to even into the building. So I wanna move up a little bit here if I can. So this is our daily tracker that we provide to the players, sort of a metrics of, of, of where we are, uh, team city. And so players can see it for themselves. Players can watch. And players know that these are areas where uh, the risk is a lot higher. And so for the most part, uh, it's important, uh, as, 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 as we mentioned earlier, that you take responsibility for ensuring your safety. And it's all the things that we, we, we just saw and we just read. Wear your mask, wash your hands, six feet away, because we can incubate you in a bubble at work. We can ensure to as much as possible that you can mitigate your risk of contracting the virus at work. They've done, I mean, I mean, they have really, really done a great job of ensuring that each facility in our league is under somewhat of a quarantine as it relates to making sure that players are in the most safest environment possible. And those who are infected have them removed from the protocol, uh, we have them removed from facilities as soon as possible, okay? But most important, when you leave the facility, that's when you have to enter the world of everyday life and making decisions. If you do have children, do you allow anyone in your home that hasn't been tested, okay? Do you allow yourself to go out to dinner with your family with no mask and not sit six feet away from the next table? Do you go to events? Do you go to functions? Do you, go, do you have activities where you will be more than, uh, in a group of more than 10? These are the things that unfortunately we can't control, but our players have taken a, a personal oath to say, we need to do it because I need to protect my family and my children. So we, I just wanted to give you a glimpse of some of the things that, that we've shared with our members and to ensure as much as possible, that they've given, been given all the information they can on this uh, novel and emerging virus, and to ensure that they understand that colleges are watching them, more importantly, high schools who have lost their season, a lot of small colleges have lost their season. So uh, a lot of them understand the importance of, if you want to play, these are the things that you must dedicate yourself to doing, because we have the information. And getting back to play is no different than what we're telling all of America. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and please use six feet distance in order to get everyone back to some form of normalcy. And so I really wanna uh, leave with that, and I wanna thank you for your time, and I'm sure we'll have questions uh, later in the presentation. Uh, thank you very, very, very much, uh, Carl, for your very valuable uh, insights and really the rare uh, human, I think, window that you provided in terms of the impact not only on the players or families and the fans and so on. 
I, I uh, in, again, in the interest of time, we, we can spend much more, hopefully we'll come back to it, but uh, to me, uh, I, I think uh, knowing a little bit about your work in the uh, background, I, I was very much interested what, what kind of message uh, can you give to the uh, next generation, so to speak, to the youngsters with whom you, you worked for many, many years? So, so in other words, I, I think uh, that's uh, really the question as all of us as parents, grandparents and so on, we, we have to deal with this uh, issue uh, every single day. Anyway, I, I, I want to thank you again. We, I think we have to move on yes. to our next group uh, at, this, uh, at this time. And uh, it gives me a, a great uh, pleasure and honor to uh, invite uh, the three colleagues um, who are going to participate uh, from the Cowell and Morning Labor and Employment uh, Group um, and so on, that uh, they, they will really uh, try to focus on some of these issues. I think the first uh, speaker is Shalana uh, Demeron. Uh, she is a counsel um, at, at the firm and uh, deals with uh, many uh, issues, uh, litigation, uh, for example, and she will deal with that related to the uh, sports uh, issue and so forth. Um, the next uh, speaker is uh, Thomas Gis, uh, who is a founding uh, member of the Crow Cowell and Mooring uh, Labor and Employment Group. And um, he will uh, also relate to some of his experiences related to the firms, um, the virus, I think, uh, working group uh, and so forth, because uh, he's, uh, as I understand, involved in counseling uh, many uh, companies and so on in respect to the COVID-19. And uh, last but not least is uh, Christoph Vux, who is a co-managing partner of Crowell and Mooring uh, office in the Brussels. And uh, as I understand, he's also a partner of the intellectual property group there. And uh, he deals with many of the COVID-19 uh, issues, uh, not only in Brussels, but Europe in general. So I would like to, the three of you, uh, try to uh, share some of your uh, insights and suggestions at this very difficult time. Well, thank you so much. Um, just to start, I mean, it's been great listening to um, all the speakers. Um, and a lot of you, a few of you took the words out of my mouth. So my opening remarks will be um, a bit short, but I must say that it's pretty amazing when we think about where we were in March when the Olympics um, were canceled or, pro or postponed to where we are now, fast forward to July of 2020, where sports is now reopening. Um, and while there's pressure to get back to business as usual, it's impossible to eliminate all risk of exposure to COVID-19. Thus, from a legal perspective, um, liability exposure persists, right? Indeed, COVID-19 outbreaks have been traced back to sporting events that took place during the early days of COVID. Um, and what makes these issues of legal liability even more complicated is the fact that there are differing opinions on safety and there are, different, there are differing opinions on um, you know, what exactly is the appropriate standard of care. Uh, this all fosters unique issues that intersect public health with commercial and employment law. So we will explore these issues um, and evaluate steps that can be taken within the sports ecosystem, as well as other mass gatherings to limit liability exposure. Can we go to the next slide, please? And the next, okay. Um, so what will we cover? Specifically, we will review general principles of exposure liability under US law. Uh, we will discuss COVID-19 liability considerations. Uh, we will then explore mitigation strategies and risk management concepts, 
and then we'll spend a little bit of time on the current state of play of U.S. professional sports, European sports, and U.S. collegiate sports. And we'll be focusing primarily on legal implications um, and how, you know, standards of care are actually being shaped in real life. Uh, next slide, please. One more, please. Thank you. So, consumer facing businesses and organizations are uniquely positioned in the age of COVID 19. These are high traffic industries where every consumer, every spectator, every visitor, every fan is a potential um, plaintiff, right? And they're we're being faced with some very difficult questions. For instance, like, what do you do if a customer refuses to wear a mask? Uh, what do you do if a customer who's visiting your establishment refuses to wear a mask, but also claims that he or she has a medical condition that prevents the wearing of a mask? And in addition, uh, torts, la torts lawsuits could be crushing to businesses that have already taken a financial hit from the pandemic and stay at home orders. This includes the prospect of take-home exposure. Uh, we just heard a little bit about NFL players being concerned with, you know, getting exposed to COVID-19 and taking it home to their family, right? Now in the torts world, there's actually, um, you know, a bystander exposure cause of action where that third party could then possibly sue a company to say, well, I might not have caught COVID-19 on your premises, but I got it because someone else caught it and then they brought it home to me. So those are something that, you know, could be crushing um, to companies. And in the world of COVID, it's absolutely impossible um, to limit all risk of exposure. So um, the risk of liability just remains. So while COVID-19 litigation will be new, um, traditional torts concepts are not, and these concepts will be hotly contested in the new um, wave of COVID-19 litigation. And the very nature of COVID-19 presents a challenge for plaintiffs and premises liability cases because of the lengthy incubation period between exposure and the development of symptoms. So even if plaintiffs have been strictly adhering to stay-at-home orders in normal circumstances, it will be difficult for a plaintiff to pinpoint exactly where and when exposure occurred. So the first hurdle to, um, to plaintiffs will be just proving simple negligence, right? Negligence is defined as failure to behave with the level of care that someone of ordinary prudence would have exercised under the same circumstances. Um, the behavior usually consists of actions, but can also consist of omissions when there is some duty to act. So we've listed here the four elements of a negligence claim, and we'll just dig a little bit deeper into what each of those, um, those elements actually mean. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the first element is establishing a legal duty. Um, there must be the existence of a legal duty that the defendant owed to the plaintiff, right? So there generally is a duty from to a business owner, to a customer, to an innkeeper, I mean, from, for, from an innkeeper to a guest, um, for example. And they will have to also prove that the defendants breached that legal duty, right? So sometimes, but not always, a breach of duty will be easy to establish. For example, if most others in the same industry had taken preventative steps that, that the defendants had not actually taken. Um, in the age of COVID, establishing and articulating a standard of care may be pretty difficult, right? Um, this is the degree of care a reasonable person should have exercised under the circumstances. And there's a lot of uncertainty here, right? Um, but, you know, establishing a standard of care um, in COVID cases may be difficult, but it won't actually actually uh, be impossible, right? In one of the um, cases, um, cases dealing with Legionnaire's disease are pretty on point here. Um, Legionnaire's is a bacteria that is found in water systems. And unlike COVID, there's absolutely, well, there's very, very little guidance 
on the standard of care and what um, companies should or should not do with respect to their water systems to limit the risk of Legionnaire's disease. And unlike COVID, we have a myriad of guidance documents, right, from the CDC, from state and local government agencies. Um, so, you know, it's, it won't be impossible to establish the standard of care, but there will be some difficulties because there is so much um, diversity in the landscape on what exactly companies are doing to prevent or reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. The third hurdle to plaintiffs will be um, to prove a sufferance of an injury. Um, now, this may be a hurdle. In fact, um, COVID-19 cases have been brought against passengers of cruise ships, and at least one court um, interpreting maritime law has said that fear of contracting COVID while being stuck on a ship was not a valid emotional injury, right? So this proves, just reiterates, that the injury must be concrete and fear of injury may not be sufficient. The third hurdle to plaintiffs will be proving causation. And this may be one of the most difficult uh, aspects um, when we're you know, talking specifically uh, about COVID-19 litigation. Um, this may be difficult to prove if plaintiffs are, are unable to actually establish that there was a causation moment. For example, you can more easily establish causation when you are stuck on a cruise ship or if you're stuck in a nursing home, right? And then you contract COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more difficult to establish causation when there are more sporadic interactions, right? It's, it's very difficult to point to your visit to Kroger, to a grocery store, um, and say that this is the reason, this is where I contracted COVID-19. It's very difficult to point to your attendance to a baseball game and say that this is where I actually um, contracted COVID-19. Right, because plaintiffs will need to establish that the virus was contracted on defendant's premises. Um, and we can compare this again to the Legionnaires um, disease example, because uh, Legionnaires is not actually a contagious disease, right? So unlike COVID, where you can catch it from anywhere, um, Legionnaires will be traced back to a particular water system. And so it's more easy to define an actual causation moment. Now, from a litigation perspective, um, the question as to whether plaintiffs have been following public health guidelines will be key, right? So I can envision defense attorneys uh, scouring plaintiffs' social media, right? They're going to want to know every place plaintiffs have been and to just poke holes in their causation moment argument. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we're discussing gross negligence and intentional torts, right? Um, these are, again, very difficult um, things for plaintiffs to actually prove. Uh, gross negligence is defined as a lack of care that demonstrates reckless disregard for the safety or lives of others, which is so great, it appears to be a conscious violation of other people's rights to safety. Right? In the age of COVID, there's, it's very unclear what exactly constitutes gross negligence. Um, does a failure to enforce a mask policy um, cross the line from negligence to gross negligence? Uh, those are questions, or that's a question that has yet to be seen. Um, and for intentional torts, plaintiffs will have to actually prove that the defendant intentionally infected them with COVID-19. So why does gross negligence and intentional torts matter? Well, one way it matters is because of damages. Once you get into you know, gross negligence and intentional torts, um, you know, you can cross the line from just compensatory damages where you're attempting to make the plaintiff whole to punitive damages where the defendant is actually being punished for bad acts. And again, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, when you're thinking about ways to mitigate the risk of liability and perhaps even using waivers, um, in many jurisdictions, waivers do not actually apply to um, gross negligence, right? So if plaintiffs can prove that a business has been grossly negligent, um, just the fact that they, he or she might have signed a waiver would not um, protect the business from liability. Next slide, please. So Tom, can you comment um, on how COVID has complicated the analysis of standard of care? Certainly will, thanks Shalana. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to take a couple of minutes and uh, apply the general principles of tort and other types of uh, litigation that Shalana has summarized through the world of COVID. Um, I will say this as a lawyer, Dr. Ref doesn't remember this, but once I was a patient of his, and I want to start out by saying that I've got the same bottom line reaction that he does. If you want to describe this in one word, the word would be uncertainty. Sponsors of sporting events, whether professional, collegiate, or amateur, kids sports, have a broad range of liability concerns, as the audience knows, including concerns about lawsuits from their own employees, from the teams, if the sponsors are leagues, from the players, from the media, from vendors, from customers, and everybody else that you can imagine. Um, I didn't put labor unions in that category for a reason. As we've heard from Carl, uh, labor unions are doing exactly what they should be doing. They're trying to protect their members and they're doing a very good job of that. But as you can see, and as everybody on this program knows, um, there's quite a bit of uh, concern. And I think some of it is due to the welter of inconsistent and overwhelming um, a flood of guidance that we've received uh, since this began. And you see that on this slide. Um, you know, many of us uh, were working in this area before the World Health Organization declared this to be a pandemic, but that changed everything. And as most everybody knows, the White House began with this uh, phased uh, reopening plan. We have, I've lost count, at least 75 different guidance documents from CDC. Uh, there have been hundreds of state and local public health orders. Uh, first, they were stay in place or shelter in place orders, other form of lockdown orders. And then there's been a whole series of reopening orders that include environmental health and safety requirements, uh, self-quarantine requirements and the like. And I've, I've lost count. We monitor these things. And the last time I looked, we had over 500 pages of summaries of the state and local public health orders. That is an awful lot to keep up with. And then at the bottom of the slide, you see a partial list only of other federal regulatory initiatives. Some are uh, more employment focused, that's what the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission does, EEOC. Others are more industry focused. The Department of Agriculture regulates the meatpacking industry. There's been a lot of litigation filed against meatpackers because they have been hot spots. And the Food and Drug Administration is very active in regulating um, many of the items of PPE and uh, sanitizers and other things. Uh, other federal regulatory agencies are listed here. Another principal one is OSHA. So there's lots to keep up with. Next slide, please. And so what I'd like to do is just summarize the types of exposure litigation in the US courts only. Christoph will do a compare and contrast with Europe in a minute. The kinds of uh, workforce uh, workplace or exposure litigations that we're seeing. Uh, you see here the first list is employment claims, a full range of employment claims. We won't talk too much about that, although I note that uh, sponsors and leagues uh, and teams, anybody who employs people, should be worried about these kinds of claims as well. But the health and safety litigation and the negligence and wrongful death claims that uh, Shalana alluded to are I think the most interesting for this audience. So let's go to the next slide and dig into that a little bit. So what types of exposure litigation are we mostly concerned about? Let me start with something called public nuisance because this may not be familiar to everybody in the audience. Public nuisance is an ancient tort that goes back to common law in the Middle Ages in England. And it was used when some party took an action that um, basically interfered with the rights of others. The common example most of us learned in law school is somebody puts a big barrier on a public road so everybody else can't pass. So at common law in England, uh, somebody could go to an equity court and get an order of what was called abatement. And abatement orders require the, the perpetrator of the nuisance to remove it. So if it was a barrier in the road, they would have to remove it. As the tort developed, it also permitted the recovery of damages. So that was, that was then. Now where are we? Well, in the United States most recently, like so many things related to what's 
properly called a litigation explosion. The public nuisance theory has been expanded greatly and used in a lot of situations involving different kinds of exposures. Environmental pollution cases, as asbestos cases, tobacco, lead paint, climate change, and now opioids, if you read about that in the paper. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers are able to take advantage of relatively low causation requirements to contrast what Shalana was talking about generally, along with the abatement remedy and the possibility of damages for anybody who is negatively impacted with a lower causation requirement. And that kind of case, as you might expect, and I don't mean this pejoratively at all, pejoratively at all but it is the holy grail for uh, the plaintiff's bar. And uh, we are seeing a lot of cases filed um, where these kinds of theories have been asserted. Now, let me say a word about workers' compensation. Um, some of you may know this, uh, if you are injured at work, uh, your remedy supposedly exclusively is exclusively uh, workers' compensation. And there's a whole separate scheme for that, which we're not going to get into in this audience. But there are recognized exceptions to workers' compensation, some of which Shalana has already alluded to. There's fraudulent concealment, that's the most common, any kind of intentional tort, willful or serious misconduct, or gross negligence. In those circumstances, where it can be proved, even your direct employee or an independent contractor who should be treated as an employee, even that person can file a lawsuit against um, the employer or the sponsor of the event uh, on, on that kind of a theory. One more thing to say, I'm going to just talk quickly about class actions. Um, under some of these theories, uh, creative plaintiff's lawyers are able to cobble together plausible class action theories, and those, are, of course, are obviously more troublesome for defendants because of the possibility of multiple damages. Now, immunities. Um, two things I want to say about immunities to sort of close the loop on this part of liability. The first is that in response to COVID, many states have passed laws that uh, basically presume that any illness uh, workers' comp type claim was, is presumed to have occurred in the workplace. And that gets around the causation arguments that Shalana talked about in regular tort actions. I think it's a dozen states that have enacted some kinds of laws some version of these laws that presume a COVID case was caused at work. Now that's a mixed blessing for the employer or the respondent because in theory, if a claim is covered by work and comp workers' compensation, it cannot also be covered in a tort claim along the lines of what Shalana um, described. So there is that. Now onto immunities themselves. Um, Congress is back. Uh, everybody's reading the paper. Among the principal provisions of the Republican version of the next stimulus bill is a fairly broad reaching liability protection or immunity from suit uh, that would benefit employers, sponsors of public health, uh, uh, sponsors of sporting events, um, um, health care providers, and a wide range of businesses. Um, there are some cases that uh, situations where states have already enacted such immunities. Those are mostly cases involving the healthcare uh, sector on the obvious theory that we absolutely need the healthcare sector and we really can't have a situation where healthcare uh, facilities can't continue to operate because of fear of litigation. So um, that's a very quick summary of a lot of very complicated concepts about how litigation, exposure lit litigation applies specifically in the COVID world, and we'll talk a little bit later about steps that, are, uh, that the sports leagues are taking. But before I leave, just a minute on the last bullet point here. Um, you know, I think the critical challenge for anybody in this environment is what is the standard of care? Well, as we've already seen, and Dr. Ref talked about this as well, the standard of care is morphing at warp speed. Uh, all this new guidance changes it. And I think you have to remember, defendants have to remember that what is thought of as appropriate is always viewed with 2020 hindsight. It's called hindsight bias. And so you may be doing your best in July of 2020 to take the most prudent steps to keep everybody safe, but a judge or a jury or a plaintiff's lawyer 18 months later is going to say, why in the world did you do this? And why in the world didn't you do A, B, C, and D? So that's... Um, 
I think in a nutshell, the biggest concern in a time of great uncertainty about the science and the law and public impatience and all the rest, uh, I would just say in one word, uh, meeting that standard of care is the most difficult challenge that most businesses, including sponsors of sporting events have. Shalana, back to you. I think you're muted. You're right. Next slide, please. <laughs> So, one more slide, please. Uh, businesses are jumping at the bit to figure out how to um, limit this liability that Tom was um, summarizing. And waivers um, are one option, right? Um, in, and I've read in the paper that the NFL has been considering requiring fans to sign COVID-19 liability waivers before attending games. Um, the Trump campaign was in the news just recently when, you know, they um, required um, attend like attendees of a rally to uh, sign COVID-19 waivers before attending the rally. Um, and so there's a great debate about, you know, the enforceability of COVID-19 waivers. Um, I like to think of there being about three schools of thought with respect to this issue. Um, the first school of thought, you know, they'll say well, these waivers are not worth the paper that they are written on, right? Um, other folks believe that a well-drafted waiver may be enforceable. And then the third school of thought uh, subscribes to the opinion that whether enforceable or not, the waiver provides really good evidence of a notice of risk. Right? So waivers are not bulletproof. And whether waivers hold up in court is ultimately for a judge to decide. However, um, the general legal framework on waivers is instructive and should apply. And we know that in many uh, jurisdictions, waivers are enforceable when drafted correctly. So on this slide, we have the general legal framework and some principles to keep in mind when drafting waivers. Um, the first principle is to make sure that the waiver stands out, it needs to be clear and unambiguous. Um, make it clear that the signer is waiving certain rights. For example, if it's part of another document, um, we can make sure that it's bold or in larger print um, and advise at the front of a long document that it includes a liability waiver. The waiver should also clearly mention COVID-19 in order to disclaim injuries to claims caused by COVID-19. Um, we need to make sure that the waivers are easy to read, right? So get rid of these, of a lot of this legal language that lawyers love so much, especially when it's consumer um, or stay in facing. The waiver should clearly state what type of claims or damages are being waived and the waiver must be signed. Um, this is a very important requirement here. Um, posting a waiver is ineffective. Um, the click acceptance, for example, if um, a fan perhaps is purchasing tickets online and you have to click to accept the conditions of a waiver, that may be enforceable um, and, um, depending on the jurisdiction. However, I want to flag a limitation to waivers and that is a limitation to their application of third parties. Um, for example, if I were to purchase tickets for my family of four and then click to waive all liability if someone contracts COVID um, during the event, um, I may be bound by that waiver, but it's going to be an uphill battle um, finding that my husband and my children are also bound by that waiver, right? And so we'll need to just take care and think through strategically how to make sure that that waiver is actually attaching. Um, and again, a waiver does not apply to take home lawsuits, right? Like third parties. Um, and so it's really only the person who's signing the waiver. Um, and then another thing to flag is that in some jurisdictions, um, a parent is not able to waive liability on behalf of their child either, right? So again, that's something else just to keep in mind. Um, waivers should be reasonable, of course, and waivers should provide information sufficient for a consumer to provide informed consent. Um, to be honest, from a business perspective, waivers oftentimes 
place a bad taste taste in the mouth of business people um, because some folks think you know you see a waiver then that means that a company um, is trying to cut corners right and will not comply with the law um, but from my perspective that's far from the truth and in fact the fact that you do you should actually describe a company's COVID-19 procedures gives the company an opportunity to make it look very good and to clearly outline all the steps in which um, the company or the business is um, complying with the standard of care, right? And that could definitely come back and create a very good document for you in the event that there is uh, litigation. And as um, Tom noted, establishing a standard of care is very, very important. And again, a waiver could just be um, an opportunity just to um, outline how you are complying with the standard of care. Now, as I stated, there are some limitations. We talked about the third party limitations. Um, I wanted to, to like just pass the ball back to Tom to speak a little bit about um, waiver limitations in the employment context. Yes, thanks, Solana. Um, we make a distinction between third party waivers and employee waivers. Employee waivers we do not recommend. They're under, they're contrary to public policy under most states because most state laws affirmatively um, permit people to file workers' compensation claims. And there are other theories that you can't make a prospective waiver of a claim. There's unequal bargaining power between employers and employees. So I think of among the many things we're talking about here today, one of the easiest is we don't recommend waivers for employees. Now, notices, acknowledgements, and those kinds of things, I think are useful and productive in order to establish uh, no, uh, in notice on behalf of the uh, individual and assumption of the risk. And one last thing before I kick it back to Shalana, since this is a program about sports, any of you who have ever been to a Major League Baseball game, if you ever looked at the back of the ticket, there's an assumption of the risk language there. You assume the risk of getting hit by a batted ball. Uh, if you go skiing, your ski lift ticket, uh, you assume the risk. You assume the risk because people know that skiing is inherently dangerous, and so you assume the risk of breaking your leg and falling down and hurting yourself. You don't assume the risk of the ski lift breaking and you falling off the ski lift. So, uh, Shalana, back, back to you just with that little uh, comment. And Thanks so much, Tom. Um, again, there's another uh, limitation for um, essential activities. Waivers for activities that are considered to be um, essential or unavoidable are likely unenforceable under the public policy exception, right? Liability waivers governing more voluntary activities are more likely to be enforced. Um, but this raises in and of itself some interesting questions, right? Um, just backing away from the sports context, like are grocery stores considered public necessities? Um, what about universities? What about healthcare service facilities? Um, these are difficult questions and they will vary based on the jurisdiction. Um, gross negligence is another limitation to waivers as well as intentional and reckless conduct. Uh, liability waivers generally cannot exculpate liability for these types of conduct. Um, and again, it's unclear what exactly constitutes gross negligence, right? The way that we view gross negligence today may be a little different next year this time when we're looking back, as Tom said, retrospectively, you have those, you know, the hindsight is 2020, right, perspective. Um, and then you can take a closer look at exactly what was occurring. Um, and so what would appear to have not have been gross negligence uh, at the time may be gross negligence in the future. Next slide, please. So Tom, can you summarize some of the steps being taken by professional sports in the US and the challenges? I sure will, thank you, Shalana. Um, this is a way to um, tee up uh, what we'll hear, uh, next slide please, what we'll hear later from Christoph, because this is gonna be a little uh, compare and contrast between US and, the, and, and Europe. Uh, uh, Dr. Reff has talked a lot about some of this. As we all know, sports have gradually reopened since June. Um, I, the way I think about it, there are maybe three different approaches. One is the bubble strategy in basketball. Both men's and women's are an example of that. Hockey is a two-hub city approach. 
uh, two cities in Canada where they think they can make everybody safe and continue. Uh, they're going to resume, I think, in a few days. Professional golf and race car, auto race car, is what I'm calling the traveling pod approach, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then Major League Baseball, that's what I would call regional pods. Now, there's been quite a bit of press reports about what's going on with baseball. I suppose in the newspapers, baseball, because it's baseball season, has gotten even a little more coverage than the NFL that Carl talked about. But you can see here on this slide that um, there have been different strategies taken by the various sports. Now, before I move on, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying this just because I'm a lawyer, but I'm not going to pass judgment on any particular approach in the comments that follow. It's really just going to be observations about what we're seeing. Um, and so let's go to the next slide so we can start in a little more detail. So, okay, basic concepts, a quick review. You've heard some of this from Carl. Those of you in the medical profession already know all this. Uh, prevention protocols include all the things that you see here. Uh, some of the leagues are testing at a different frequency. All the leagues are running across the problem that we all have in this country about the time between taking the test and getting the results and what do you do in the meantime. Uh, all the leagues are doing system monitoring. Uh, all are practicing different kinds of social distancing. All have uh, a, a protocol for positive test responses. What do you do if somebody tests positive? What do you do about people who are in close contact? What do you do about disinfecting and all the rest? Contact tracing, a word on that, as some of the people in this group know, that's a traditional public health requirement or uh, function, I should say, that with COVID has been imposed or extended to uh, others, uh, participants in the private sector. Uh, employers and sponsors of professional sports are now undertaking, along with public health agencies, the job of contract tracing. And again, just to renew that, the idea behind it is that you want to try to figure out everybody that person who was infected was in contact with during the relevant period of time, contact them, get them to get tested and treated, and therefore the thinking is if you can identify everybody that the person who was infected with has come in contact with and isolate all of those people, that's the way to tamp down a communicable disease. And that's, you know, well settled. I think it goes back 75, maybe 100 years in public health. The problem, of course, with COVID is it's very, very hard to keep track in the same way. So one of the major reasons for the pods and the bubbles is that it makes it easier to do contact tracing. Um, the other big thing, of course, that every uh, sports um, um, entity is, uh, de is dealing with is when, I mean, no fans for now, but when possibly can fans uh, be readmitted in order to get something closer back to normal. Um, so I want to say um, a little bit more about um, baseball, uh, but before I do, yeah, let's go to the next slide. There, there we go. So this is um, more specific detail about how sports leagues are trying to protect the bubbles or the pods and the players and the participants. Uh, there are and some of this comes from Major League Baseball. Some of you may know they have over a 100-page operating manual, and this is a summary of it. But this applies to most of the other sports. I'm going to talk separately about golf and tennis in a minute. But you know, uh, the characteristic of all these sports leagues is limiting access to the facilities, compliance with state and local quarantine orders and that's quite important because you can't operate on in violation of public health orders and many of the public health orders um, have precluded uh, mass gatherings quote unquote that would prohibit sporting events to continue even if there were no fans a word about golf I mentioned um, there have been uh, exceptions granted by state and local governments to facilitate uh, sporting events as happened in baseball just in the last week. Um, the District of Columbia, as an example, and New York as well, have made an exception for their 14-day quarantine orders for to facilitate the travel of Major League Baseball fans. And um, the U.S. Open in golf is one of the biggest um, you know, golf tournaments in the in the world. This year it's going to be uh, set uh, uh, scheduled just outside New York 
in Westchester County. Uh, it was announced just the other day, no fans. Their plan until two weeks ago is that they'd be able to have fans. Most of you who even know a little bit about golf know about this tournament called the Masters. That's been rescheduled to November. Their plan has been to have fans. We will see if they're going to be able to pull that off. But just yesterday I read in the paper, uh, the New York uh, government, state government, uh, gave a waiver to the U.S. Golf Association to permit uh, the U.S. Open to take place without requiring all participants to self-quarantine for 14 days. So that's an example of the many, uh, many aspects of this dynamic. Travel's an obvious consideration, as is hotels, uh, facilities, you know, who, uh, what, what do you do about keeping various facilities clean and disinfected, uh, social distancing, obviously. Temperature monitoring, that's being done in different ways across sports. Uh, testing, as I've already said, and Carl spoke to this, um, different leagues are testing differently. Golf has had a different approach to the, some of the team sports. And then we get to masks. Uh, and if you can watch sporting events on TV, you'll see who's wearing masks and who isn't. Golfers are not. Uh, we'll see um, whether or not uh, basketball players do tonight, uh, and I don't know what the NFL is going to do about that. And the last thing on this slide is, uh, you know, every team in every league has some sort of a COVID action plan about what to do following a positive test. So next slide, please. Okay, um, baseball, just for a minute. Um, this has been widely reported, so I won't take a lot of time and I won't make judgments, but Major League Baseball restarted on Thursday the 23rd. By Sunday the 26th, there was a mass outbreak. Uh, the Miami Dolph of Marlins were playing up in Philadelphia. Um, they went home, and then they were going to have some games against teams traveling down to Miami, including our home team. I'm in Washington as well. The Washington Nationals were supposed to fly down there. Um, and so on. Anyway, long story short, their games have been postponed through Sunday. The Philadelphia Phillies, where they had been playing, their games are postponed through Friday. Uh, and I should probably uh, close this by talking about the Toronto Blue Jays, which I just think is fascinating. The Ontario government issued an, or an edict essentially saying that the Blue Jays cannot play any of their games at home. Uh, the, Toronto, the Canadian government is properly uh, concerned about uh, uh, immigration, essential, non-essential travel into Canada is still banned through the end of August. And so the Canadian government decided they weren't going to permit U.S. baseball players and their entourage to travel up to Canada. So the Toronto Blue Jays were without a home for some period of time, and they are going to split their games between and among various stadiums. Um, and most of their games will be played in their AAA affiliate state uh, stadium in Buffalo, which uh, isn't that too far from Toronto, but it sure isn't sure isn't uh, the home stadium. So that's just a couple of illustrations of the challenges facing Major League Baseball. Next slide, please. Let's see, how are we doing on slides here? Okay, we're going to kick this over to Christoph now, who's going to give a compare and contrast about what's going on in the world of sports and other mass events in Europe. Christoph? I tried, okay. I tried to unmute and it happened, I think. So thank you, Tom. Um, I'm honored to give this presentation. Um, I've been asked to give the view from Europe. The whole problem in this pandemic that there is no Europe. Um, that's also due to the fact that the European Union has no jurisdiction with respect to uh, public health. That's a matter for uh, domestic law and for the, the different uh, member states of the European Union. But also we have seen no voice from the European politicians. So that's, that's, that's one consideration from my side. It's a missed opportunity to strengthen the European Union. What we have seen is a scattered approach in the European Union. We all know the example of Sweden. They go for group, group unity. Uh, the UK went uh, for group unity until Boris Johnson ended up in the hospital. Um, we had Spain, we had Italy, 
Uh, everyone had diff different, different uh, approaches and everything led to a closure of the borders. So um, not much of a Europe, unified Europe uh, in pandemic times, which is a missed opportunity. Uh, second remark, unfortunately, I have to say that we are uh, experiencing a second wave now. And that's due to a large extent to economic reasons. And there's the relationship with sports, of course, uh, money is involved. So we, we have beaten the curve, everything was going well, but then was it uh, summer season. And Italy, Croatia, Spain, they live from tourists. So what happened? Curve went down, borders were opened. And what do we see now? People return from their holidays and we see uh, an influx, an increase of uh, contaminations. So we are faced with um, uh, a second wave now. We are in Belgium in a, so in a basically social lockdown and we even have a curfew. So I have to make sure that I end it timely because otherwise I can't get home because I'm in the office. Um, from that's our political observation, so not a lot of Europe. From a legal perspective, if I compare the situation with the US, um, I think we are not too much concerned about litigation and about uh, liability. Uh, when we talk about liability, we talk about potential plaintiff claims for on behalf of um, fans attending uh, events, sports events. I've been thinking about claims by uh, sporters, athletes. Uh, it's not, in my opinion, not a, a big concern because we don't know the concept of class actions and in some limited consumer cases there's a possibility but in in this type of um, pandemic uh, times i think uh, class actions will not fly um, we don't have a tradition of allowing a lot of damages we don't know the concept of punitive damages i'll give you an example uh, in the sports sports world in 1985 maybe some of you remember that if you are interested in, uh, in European soccer, we had the Hazel Stadium disaster where 39 Juventus fans uh, died and 600 were injured when they were attending the European Champions Cup final in Brussels between Liverpool and Torino. The blame for the incident was laid on the fans of Liverpool but also the uh, European uh, Football Association the owners of the stadium and the Belgian police were prosecuted. This took years of litigation and eventually there was a settlement agreement for 6.2 million. 6.2 million for 39 dead and 600 casualties. I mean, this is nothing, it, but it, it gives you an idea of how we look at um, uh, damages in, in the EU and in the um, several uh, European countries. Again, here in liability law, EU tort law, EU tort law as such does not exist. It's uh, domestic law that needs to be applied. So you cannot ask um, damages for the whole of Europe. It's, it's a national and national country by country basis uh, litigation. Um, the liability of the organizer depends on the bonus part of familias principle. You know, Europeans like speaking other languages and especially Latin. And this means that if the sports organization has taken the necessary precautions and did everything to follow the COVID-19 safety measures, it's unlikely that the organization can be held liable. Um, so the threshold for liability claim is rather high. Um, another contrast with the US is that uh, waivers of liability will not fly. Um, we don't see them, of course, and on tickets you see uh, a, kind of a waiver, sounds sound similar as a notice in the US, but in general in court, uh, they do not fly. Uh, something I would like to remark uh, as well, and, and I have to refer to Dr. Ref, sports and mass uh, people events are dangerous. Remember the uh, Champions League game between Atalanta and Bergamo and Valencia in, in uh, Italy in March. That was the source of a lot of contaminations and hundreds of infections in the north of Italy. So we have to be very careful when we talk about sports and reopening 
um, the playgrounds again. Um, Take slide, please. What I see as a potential area of uh, litigation, liability litigation in the in the EU and in the domestic countries, um, are is litigation by the players, which are regarded as employees. Uh, this is due to the fact that um, all uh, organizers, all teams, are on ob obligation to guarantee a safe and healthy work environment, and it's even sanctioned with criminal sanctions. I think this is similar to the US. There are a lot of defenses, but I think it, uh, it will be very difficult to um, overcome a liability claim when you did not take the necessary uh, precautions as an organizer or as a team owner. Uh, next slide. Uh, when we look at the prevention techniques, um, again, country by country uh, techniques, there are even differences at regional level. And it's very often sports association specific, as in the US. So what we see is that there are specific government guidelines, but it's up to the governing, governing bodies and associations to assess the risk and to ensure that there's a safe environment for players and fans. So as in the US, there is no consistency. It's very difficult to follow all the guidelines, all the government guidelines, which are implemented by the associations. Some examples, you have the Bundesliga, the, the German um, soccer league. Uh, they resumed quite rapidly, I think uh, already in May. Um, crowd control, 300 people wearing masks were allowed in the stadium. They were divided in zones. Players must stay in quarantine during one week before the game. And even the balls must be disinfected. So it's similar as in um, the US. Next slide. Soon we will have the Tour de France, so uh, that cannot be held uh, at one place. It, it will be all over France, so uh, I have difficulties to understand how they will go to deal with that, because it's very difficult to control the crowd if, you're, if you are um, riding the public roads in, in France. But they will use a mobile laboratory to provide corona tests, there will be crowd control measures, uh, there will be no podia, there will be no uh, publicity caravans and so on and so forth. So they try to avoid uh, a crowd, but in my opinion, uh, this will be inevitable. Um, Champions League will start soon again. There's a framework of sanitary and hygiene related procedures. Matches are behind closed doors. Um, normally it's a home and a game, home and away um, system, uh, but the uh, European Champions League organization has decided to organize everything in Lisbon. But what happened in Lisbon, parts of Lisbon are now in lockdown because to the high number of uh, contamination. So it remains to be seen what they're going to do there. And also when you look at tennis, so the French Open, there are tickets available again as from last week for bubbles of four. And then the US Open are behind closed doors and you see a lot of uh, but uh, players not participating. So it's, it's inconsistency all over the place, like in the US. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to, to point to, to one uh, technique in, in Belgium. Um, we have in Belgium what we call the COVID event risk model. And this model was developed in partnership with scientific experts, specialized researchers, and the Alliance of Belgian Event Federations. Uh, this model can be used to gain an insight into the COVID safety uh, risks of any event. It results in a green, orange, or red, red safety label, and this label is then considered as the reference by local governments when granting permits for uh, large events. The COVID model, uh, event risk model, has specific protocols uh, and um, general protocol to deal with events and specific protocol protocols uh, for uh, sports and for uh, uh, music festivals. So it's, it's very interesting. If you try to organize something in Belgium, you can use this model. And on the basis of this assessment, the government will grant you permission to have a 200 plus uh, attendees event. Actually, um, the 200 plus is already old news because as of uh, the beginning of this week, we cannot organize uh, any events anymore given the increase in contaminations in Belgium. Um, next slide. Um, 
of course, a lot of challenges. Uh, I think a lot of people already alluded to the challenges. It's all about money, of course. Uh, not only about safety but, uh, and, and health, but also about money. I give you some, some numbers. 2.72% um, uh, of the total EU employment is sports related. So it's, it's, it's a big sector. Um, all the challenges, of course, is litigation. Uh, I'm involved in litigation about broadcasting of cancelled games in the football season. Uh, there are, of course, insurance issues. What about refunding of uh, paid tickets, uh, season tickets? There are discussions about sponsors already paid up front. So that, that type of litigation is already ongoing in um, the, the Belgian courts and other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, some other thought is, the sanitary measures hinder doping controls. And the question then is, do you still have a level playing field? Um, are all games still fair? Because now you can train and you can dope yourself and you can have a better performance uh, when competing. So that is also a conservation with, which will create uh, problems. Um, I would like to end with a positive note. Next slide, please. There are, of course, opportunities. Um, I think people start thinking. Uh, event organizers are looking into different business models. And a good example is Tomorrowland. I don't know if you ever heard of Tomorrowland. It's a, it's a dance festival in Belgium. Uh, it attracts, I think, around 400,000 people in, uh, in one week. It's, it's compared to Coachella in, uh, in the US. Um, and it was canceled. Because, of course, the last one you would have, like to have is 400,000 people flying from all over the world into Belgium. That, that's asking for questions. And they, they rethought the festival and they created the digital festival. And they flew in DJs from all over the world into uh, green uh, screen studios in LA, Australia, uh, Belgium, and um, where else was it? Um, Brazil. They recorded the performance with uh, state-of-art uh, equipment, and that was all pasted into an imaginary island in collaboration with um, the video game industry. And it was a huge success. Um, there was 300 uh, terabyte of raw footage, so it was a huge uh, organization. And I think with the empty stadiums, with, with, with everything what's going on, you will see more opportunistic views and you see more digital um, uh, collaboration and digital developments. Um, Tomorrowland had last weekend over more than 1 million viewers. I read in the newspaper that the NBA will restart in Orlando, but we also will uh, paint, uh, I think, uh, uh, fans and there will be a special camera and so on and so forth. So I think the business and, and the sector will rethink their business model and it will be an opportunity to come up with ideas. And as last, I would like to say, uh, there is also an opportunity from a health perspective. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rev already referred to it. Um, we see that there are more health risks for overweight people. And I don't know whether you have read the newspaper about Boris Johnson, who considers himself too fat, and he thinks that the whole of the UK should be uh, on a diet. So that's already uh, an important development, I think. Uh, sports will help in uh, increasing that health awareness. So from a legal point of view, a lot of differences from um, uh, a professional uh, organizational, professional sports point of view, I think there are a lot of uh, similarities. So back to you, Tom or uh, Shalana. Thanks um, so much. So to just say a couple words about US collegiate sports. Next slide, please. Um, the main question that universities are dealing with are whether to reopen um, with on-campus instruction or not. And, and Dr. Um, Ref has spoken a lot about this and he, nice, and he summarized the issues nicely. Just wanted to say a couple of words about waivers and acknowledgements. Um, a number of schools have required or encouraged athletes to sign forms 
uh, acknowledging the health risk of playing during the pandemic, and in some cases, absolving the schools of liability in the case of athlete infection. Um, wanted to just highlight the Ohio State example. Ohio State has taken the approach of not requiring athletes to sign formal waivers, but to sign on to a Buckeye pledge. Um, the, the, uh, the university takes the position that this is neither a waiver nor legally binding. However, the athletes um, are taking responsibility for their own health and their responsibility to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Um, failure to uphold the pledge results in immediate removal of athletic participation in and privileges. Um, it's pretty controversial uh, waivers in the university uh, context due to that public policy uh, concerns that I alluded to earlier, um, especially with like college students and college athletes, uh, there are no unions, right? And so there's a lack of power to, um, to actually say no to a waiver or to renegotiate the terms. And in fact, Congress is actually stepping in um, just recently, the College Athlete Pandemic Safety Act was introduced, and this is a bill that would prohibit schools from making participation or receipt of athletic scholarship funding dependent upon signing a blanket COVID-19 liability waiver. Um, so again, Congress is very concerned about, athlete, about college athletes being forced to sign away their rights with respect to their ability to sue the school um, in the event of um, um, you know, becoming ill with COVID-19. Um, and with that, we'll conclude. We had a few additional words to say about college sports, but I think it's already been covered pretty nicely. Um, and it's the main takeaway is that there's just so much uncertainty in the legal world right now uh, as it pertains to COVID-19 and what the standard of care will actually be. Yana? Yeah, I, so we uh, certainly would like to thank you, the three of you, for uh, the amazing, uh, really many course brings back memories of uh, law school. And uh, thank you very much uh, for educating us. Um, and uh, certainly we're going to, to follow up in the future to look at uh, some of the legal aspects uh, related to the uh, pandemic. And obviously many of us are looking also at man-made, I think, uh, threats, uh, terrorism and so forth. I, I think uh, it's uh, looking at uh, the clock, I think um, we will have to move to our uh, commentators uh, this point, and I would like to invite our colleague Ambassador Charlie Ray, uh, who worked with us uh, for a number of years now on the role of diplomacy <coughs> uh, in world affairs and uh, with the American Academy of Diplomacy. Um, he served uh, in Africa and um, also in Asia and elsewhere. Um, uh, Charlie, would you uh, please make some comments or uh, any questions you have at this time? Uh, thanks, thanks, Yona. Uh, and in the interest of time, I will make my commentary brief. Uh, I'd first like to thank all the presenters for some outstanding uh, presentations. Uh, you, you've given us a lot to process, some of it actually quite disturbing. Uh, but all of it extremely interesting and I think useful. One of the things listening to all of these presentations, especially this, this just completed legal, uh, and, and it, it uh, follows, or I should say segues into a lot of what we've been doing over the last couple of years, and that is the, the need for a, a broad, uh, coherent policy in dealing with these issues uh, and in the case of, of sports, particularly international sports, or, uh, baseball is a good example of. Uh, the, I, I followed the I followed the adventures of the Toronto team with interest as they were trying to find a home, uh, not just 
a national, a coherent national strategy, but we, we really need to encourage countries to work together to develop ways to harmonize their local laws with and among each other uh, so that eventually uh, we can move forward and, and move into a more normal, I, I don't know what normal will be after the end of this pandemic, but whatever normal is after this, I think one of the new normals should be heightened awareness of the need for all of us to work together to make sure that we meet this enemy with a unified front. And, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely in awe at, at the amount of detailed and very complicated information that you all master. It will probably take my brain at least a week to process most of it. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to listen. Thank you, Yona. Oh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, certainly uh, uh, in terms of the role of diplomacy in this uh, area as well, I think it does present an opportunity to, to bring nations together uh, to, to combat that uh, global threat. At any rate, let me move on to our uh, next uh, commentator, Ambassador Simonovic, who uh, is the Ambassador of Croatia uh, in Washington. And as many of you know, uh, he participated in our academic work for a number of years and also published uh, uh, some very, very important uh, articles and so on. At any rate, uh, since uh, Croatia just completed uh, the uh, presidency of the uh, Council of the European Union, uh, it would be interesting, uh, Ambassador, to, to get your views uh, again uh, in light of uh, the discussion that uh, we had uh, from uh, Christoph and um, from Brussels. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, we have been just having a, a great opportunity to listen to a, to a full range of, uh, of uh, uh, opinions and angles uh, 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 related to the uh, impact of the uh, pandemic upon sports and the, um, uh, like um, almost any uh, other uh, human activity, uh, sport has been profoundly affected. But let me start with an observation following the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the intervention of my friend, the Ambassador Ray, and why having uh, two of us, two ambassadors on this panel. And that reminds me what a friend of mine recently said about diplomacy. Diplomacy is a contact sport. I mean, you cannot, you, you cannot do much if you are not having the, the uh, if you're not getting up close and personal. You can do so much uh, uh, while uh, uh, phoning around or sending emails, but uh, if you are unable to establish um, really a, a, a personal chemistry, uh, basically you end up being able to operate only with the people you knew from before. You are, you are very um, uh, uh, deprived of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, one of the uh, most important aspects of what we do, and that, that is to create new, new friendships and to, be, to, do, uh, to do really uh, uh, a lot of outreach. So the, uh, as two sportsmen, I guess, we, we are, we are uh, entitled to have an opinion on what's happening with, with the sports during the pandemic. And it has been certainly the, uh, the effects have been devastating. Uh, uh, in, in several aspects, as we have been hearing from uh, from from the, uh, the uh, distinguished speakers, the, the economy, the sport, the sport, the uh, the uh, the economy of sports, uh, the uh, the entertainment industry, advertising industry, every, everything connected with the sports has been has been uh, uh, put on a back burner, and that has deeply affected the um, careers of uh, of athletes their coaches and the, the, the entire supporting staff. I may uh, uh, take, a, take a liberty of uh, uh, giving a personal touch here. I still do a lot of sports up to a, a, a decent level, not a professional level, but I, I, I uh, can keep up with the professionals. I do boxing and the, even in my age, I can still put up some good fight. And we are, I'm, I'm really happy to see that the Mike Tyson will be back having a match in uh, September with Roy Jones Jr. Also, the, uh, both of them slightly younger than myself, but still, you know, uh, demonstrated that it can be done. 
and the uh, this particular sport has been devastated and uh, you, you can you can do something in a bubble bubble has been mentioned several times but the uh, you cannot have my club is not functioning here um, my coach is is, is uh, struggling to pay his rent uh, young fighters are not able to advance are not able to have any meaningful 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 matches nor nor, nor meaningful training which which is applicable to many basically all sports are uh, one way or another contact sports. Some of them can be done in a more, in, in a safer manner, such as golf or tennis eventually. But the, uh, the, uh, most of the sports are very, very contact and the uh, uh, martial arts sports are the uh, most contact of them all. So what you can do, what I do myself here, I have, I have a heavy bag and the, uh, I train myself, I do some shadow boxing. That's what the other people do. But it, is, it, it looks, the, uh, watching from the outside, watching, watching when you from the outside, it appears a bit autistic, really. I mean, it's, the, the point of, the, of, of any sport is to, to see you advancing and the, uh, to uh, measure yourself against the others, to have a kind of competition, to have a, to have a certain interaction. So it's not, it's not an activity meant to be done alone. You can, you can, you can do uh, something, but you cannot do certainly uh, uh, what is needed. And psychologically, you are losing steam. You are, you are not able to, um, uh, you are facing uh, uh, an increasing lack of will and the intensity of training. I'm speaking from my personal experience, but it is also very much uh, applicable to the uh, professional athletes. If they are not, ha not having the rhythm uh, of training dedicated to a particular date of an event, so they, can, they are like running on empty. They don't uh, focus. Uh, uh, and also, when it comes to the professional sports, uh, it's very, uh, it, I, I guess, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, to uh, have a healthy flow of new, uh, new athletes, attract a new talent. So basically, you are, uh, the, 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 the teams are stuck with what they have. So there is really a, a stagnation and the, the uh, uh, loss, of, uh, loss of dynamics when it comes to the professional sport, but also when it comes to the youth sport that has been made in college aid, uh, and the uh, recreational sport, which is very important for the health of, of a nation. And the people are, uh, for, the, for, for, for many of us, uh, practicing sports up to uh, one level or another, uh, it's, it's an extremely useful distraction, outlet. And the, psychologically, we end up being deprived of something which was very, very dear to, uh, to a lot of people. From the again, from the youth, from the professionals to people who are who are practicing it uh, at the at recreational level with a higher or with a lower intensity, and the, it's, some, it's something it's something which has been provided nations a kind of focal point of of of, of uh, getting together of uh, of ve of well being, and the, it's really very very something something which is extremely positive for the functioning of uh, of, of a functional society, modern society. It's a well, well regulated, healthy competition. It, it builds up character. Uh, uh, Professor Ref was nicely explaining how, what it means in terms of the uh, uh, bringing up uh, 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 kids uh, in, in a healthy manner, physically and also psychologically. Uh, so what, what remains to be said? What remains to be done? I mean, uh, uh, opening up, uh, judiciously, uh, uh, cautiously, reasonably. Uh, uh, anybody, an, anybody's guess is as good as mine's uh, guess. Uh, but to all likelihood, we will be, uh, we will be uh, under the uh, present regime for, uh, for, uh, for uh, at least for a year uh, uh, until next, next spring, next summer. Hopefully the vaccine will come before that. But the, we feel, uh, uh, again, the practitioners, the professionals, and the fans are deprived uh, of, a, of, a, of a most useful distraction and the focal point when, they, when we and we all needed it the most under the uh, under duress. So it's a double, again, it, it's a double tragedy uh, 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 for the uh, uh, visible on what happened with the, with the sports during the pandemic. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your uh, remarks. Uh, Professor Wallace, do we have a few minutes for the uh, panelists uh, to, to make any comments now? Well, why don't you give them a few minutes and then we will have to move on, Jonah. Okay, sure. Um, 
uh, Professor Caldwell or an, anyone else, or Ricky or some of the others. Is Carl there? Still there? Yeah, it was, it was a, a terrific uh, set of talks. I've learned more about sports than uh, maybe I ever wanted to know, <laughs> but it's terrific. Thank you. Yeah, Yona, it's Ricky. Um, you had asked a question about a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think it's, uh, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I think uh, the light at the end of the tunnel uh, hopefully is not the uh, freight train coming in the wrong direction. But um, <clears throat> certainly I think from a best practices perspective, um, it really is dependent upon effective leadership at the top and also the combination of clarity, consistency, and um, direction from evidence-based uh, information. Let science rule, let, let not politics enter into the picture. And <clears throat> clearly we don't have all the answers yet, but it, it gets clouded when the uh, politics begin to enter into the picture and stop the process of the science. The science has to go forward. It's been an unnecessarily long tunnel, yep. I think. And it's gonna be a while before I think we're gonna be able to resume <clears throat> any kind of normality. I agree with you, Dr. F. Yeah, I think so too. So Carl, can you say, or elaborate a bit on why you say it's a unnecessary long tunnel? Did we have to do things differently? Yes, if we, this is looking back, if we had done what we needed to do with leadership in March and April, I think we would be pretty much where Korea and um, some of the other countries are right now. This was unnecessary. It just required good leadership and uniformity. Now we've got a patchwork. And what we're doing is playing whack-a-mole uh, as the various outbreaks occur and um, we're chasing it. And it's really too bad because the alternative is herd immunity. But that means 70% of the population has to be immune. And we're nowhere near that. So I hate to be pessimistic, but I have to be realistic. Dr. Reff? That was the view in, in Sweden, eh? the herd community. And uh, I think that the virus is of such nature that it's very difficult to get herd immunity. That's right. Well, the secondary surge that's occurring now, I think is, is certainly a, is a testimony to the failure to pay attention to the original directions. And, uh, you know, it's the mentality of, well, it's not going to happen to me, and it's not going to happen to me. <clears throat> and I think it's, it, um, when, when I was looking at the statistics the other day, when um, Governor Cuomo had uh, uh, issued, uh, I think, another travel advisory for different states coming to New York, um, I was, you know, kind of, uh, it was very apparent that every southern state in the United States, except for Virginia, was on that list and as well as uh, Texas, Arizona, and California. <clears throat> and I think that's, that's pretty telling. Oh, Carl, did, did you want to make any call? I cannot hear you. No, I, I want to say this has been a eye-opener for me. You know, so a lot of times I don't get a chance to get outside of my bubble <laughs> being working in the National Football League and trying to figure out ways to uh, bring some normalcy to a sport that people say they want to see and, and, and players say they want to play. But uh, but for me personally, I mean, all the presentations have been unbelievable to me just in terms of the knowledge, information, resources that are out there. And so I, I just, uh, I'm very grateful for, for being invited to a uh, ten, I'm 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 a bit of an optimist. I, I can't help it. That's just me. So <laughs> I'm hoping it turns, but I take it day by day. That, um, but I do agree with you. I think all 
uh, for all groups and everyone, countries and everyone need to work together to fight it. Uh, I'm a person that never likes to look back on what, what happened, even though I do agree that things could have been handled a lot differently. But now as we move forward, we must share information, share methods, share medicine, share ideas on how do we move forward and get back to uh, becoming a more healthier uh, country and um, making sure that our young people are safe and uh, everyone is put in a better situation than they are today. So I'm, I'm very grateful for this group. Thank you very much, Shalom. Do you have a last word or so? I just echo everything that everyone has said. It's been an honor to speak to you guys today and just to learn so much. Um, I do think it's important to uh, just to keep in mind that we should be working together um, because while we be work while we may be working like unilaterally today, um, I think that when plaintiffs are um, challenging the decisions that we've made um, down the road, they will be taking a more holistic approach at the entire landscape and what everyone was doing. Um, and so, but again, with those words, I remain optimistic. I do hope that we um, are able to come out of this eventually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Do you have uh, a comment at this point? Uh, no, just to echo what everybody's been said. Thanks. Thank you for including us. We've all learned a lot, and we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Christoph, any comments? And we appreciate very much uh, joining us all the way from Boston. No, thank you. It's, it's good to hear the U.S. perspective because, uh, as I said, uh, we tend to focus on on uh, our own countries and, and forget the bigger picture and, and consistency. So I hope that by organizing such webinars that we learn from each other and that we have a consistent approach. Thanks. Uh, anyone else before Don takes over? If I may, I would like to, uh, on behalf of the International Law Institute, I'd like to, to thank uh, especially Shalana and Tom and Christoph and Carl Mooring for uh, their large-scale investment in this program and their expertise. So thank you very much. John? Um, well, listen, Yona, as you know, this has been a wonderful panel. I want to thank all the panelists. I won't mention sports because that would mean my tennis game this morning, which was lousy. But I'm an optimist, and I happen to be reading a book about Winston Churchill and the Battle of Britain. You know, they got through it. And I think it comes through from determination, willpower, intelligence. We've got it. We should not get gloomy prematurely. Um, so, Yona, keep on the fight. Let's have more of these panels. We're learning a great deal. If we'd had more time, I would have asked Rita about pool testing, which I know is a useful device. Maybe we'll do yes. that at another, at another one. Uh, but thank you all very much.